Hey everybody, today's topic is semaphores, what they are, how they work, and of course, an example. Welcome back everyone. For those of you that are new to the channel, all source code is available through Patreon, information in the description, and a big thanks to everyone that supports this channel and helped me make these videos. So I recently made a video about shared memory, and in that video I mentioned that sometimes when you're using shared memory you need semaphores, and today I want to dig into that topic a little bit and see if I can provide some clarity and help you understand a few things about semaphores. So semaphores fall into this big category of things that we call synchronization primitives which of course are those things that help us coordinate activity between multiple concurrently running threads or processes. Concurrent just means that they're working at the same time, and we're particularly interested in threads or processes that have to share information, memory, data, in between each other. They're working together to solve a common problem or towards a common goal. So other primitives include mutex locks, condition variables, monitors, barriers, none of which are the topic for this video. But of course, let me know if there's any of these topics that you'd like to hear more about. I have talked about mutex locks and condition variables in other videos. I'll link to those in the description. I've also talked a lot about threads and processes in other videos. I'll put links to all of those in the description. Because you might want to check those out if you're watching this video and you get to a point where you're feeling lost. But our topic for today is semaphores, and semaphores are fun. They were developed, invented, created, whatever, by Dijkstra back in the days when dinosaurs ruled the Earth, long before the Microsoft Zune became a thing for, what, a month or two? But unlike the Zune, we still occasionally use semaphores, so we're talking about them today rather than the Zune. So what is a semaphore? A semaphore is basically an unsigned integer with some quirks. One of those quirks is that changes to the integer value are atomic, meaning that if one thread or process increments the integer and another wants to decrement the integer, those increment and decrement operations cannot interrupt each other. Another quirk is how we increment and decrement. It's that we can only interact with semaphores using two operations, wait and post. Post, by the way, is sometimes called signal. So we don't just access a semaphore's value directly. If you want to do anything with it, you either call wait or post. Now, what do they do? Both are pretty simple. Wait tries to decrement the value of the semaphore. If the value is greater than zero, then it succeeds, it decrements the value, and it returns. If the value is equal to zero, it waits, hence its name, wait. And it waits until the semaphore's value becomes positive again. And then once the value is positive, then it's able to decrement it, and then it returns. Post, on the other hand, it just increments the value of the semaphore and returns. So that's all they do. Now remember, these operations are atomic, that's really important. None of this is going to work if they're not atomic. So this is how it works. Let's say that I create a semaphore and give it a value of one. And let's say I have three threads or processes sharing that semaphore. If thread A calls wait, then the value drops from one to zero. Now say thread B calls wait. Now the value is zero, so thread B can't decrement it and it just waits. It called wait and wait is just going to sit there until another thread, say thread C, comes along, calls post, and when post is called, the value increases and thread B is then allowed to decrement the value and return from wait. So do you follow all that? Now you may be asking, what happens if thread A and B call wait at the same time? Well, like I said, wait is atomic, so one of them is going to go first and the other is going to go second. We don't know which one, but you're never going to get a situation where both see a positive value and they both think they can decrement the counter and neither of them wait. If the value is one and two threads or processes call wait, one of them is going to decrement successfully and the other is going to wait until there's a post. But okay, fine, what are semaphores good for? Sometimes they're used like mutex locks to protect some critical shared resource. So these semaphores are called binary semaphores since they're only allowed to have values one and zero. You can initialize the semaphore to one and then whenever a thread or process wants to access the shared resource or critical section of code, that thread will first call wait, which is like grabbing a lock. When the thread is finished with the shared resource, it can then just call post, which is like releasing the lock. And of course, if another thread calls wait between my wait and post calls here, then they have to wait. So then once I call post down here, then they can proceed. Now, just because you can use a semaphore like a mutex lock doesn't mean you should. There are some important differences. So mutex locks have this notion of ownership. There's this idea that I hold the lock and whichever thread or process grabbed the lock, that thread or process is the one that needs to release the lock. So this notion is nowhere to be found with semaphores. Semaphores, any thread can call wait, any process can call wait, they can all call post at any time under any circumstances, 
So semaphores are more flexible than mutex locks, and that flexibility allows programming students to design a wide range of elaborate coordination schemes and tie themselves in glorious knots. So in practice, my personal preference is that I don't use semaphores if I can use a mutex lock in its place. But I do wanna show you an example today of how semaphores can actually be used and where they make sense. So let's get into some code. Now I'm going to use the code from my recent shared memory video as a starting place. You'll remember that I set up a block of shared memory and I had programs that would write text into that shared memory, read text from the shared memory, and then there was one that destroyed the block of memory. And in that example, we didn't need a lot of coordination because I was just running my programs independently, not at the same time. And so there wasn't any contention for that shared memory. It was happening at different times and so there was, there was no risk. But in this example, I wanna change things up a bit so that my reader program and my writer program have to coordinate. Now, most of the time when I find myself using semaphores, it's usually the situation where one process is producing some data and another process is consuming that data. And that's what we're going to do here. The writer is going to write a bunch of messages into the memory. It's going to be the producer and the reader is going to consume those messages. Really, it's just going to print them out, but it could be doing something more meaningful with them, which is what would happen in a real program that you were writing. Now let's start by putting the code that reads the shared memory and prints the message. Let's put that in a while loop. And we'll have it loop forever until someone puts quit into the memory. That'll be our signal that it's time to be done. And each time through the loop, we're also going to reset the memory. So we don't consume the same message twice because we don't want to get double prints. And then let's jump over to the writer. This is our producer. And just to illustrate why we need semaphores, let's put the writing also in a loop as well. So now we're going to put messages into the shared memory over and over again. And the idea is that we want the consumer to get each of these messages and print them out. And this of course is a very simplified example. Now we can jump over to the terminal. I'm using two windows here to make it easier for you to see what's going on. We can compile our code. That seems fine. Now let's run the reader program. And you notice that now it just sits there waiting for something to happen. Okay, now let's make something happen by running our writer program over in the other window. And it works sort of, ish, not, not really. We tried to send 10 messages and we only got one. So we got something, but it's not what we were looking for. But the program's still waiting, it didn't crash. And so let's try something else. If I do something like this and run a bunch of different writers concurrently, all trying to write stuff into the buffer, well, then we get more messages received, but you notice we're still missing a lot of messages. So still not exactly what we had in mind. Now, the problem here is simple. The fact is there's just no coordination. The reader doesn't know when a message is ready and the writer doesn't know when the reader is finished with the last messages. So it just keeps overwriting the old message. And so this is where we're going to bring in our semaphores. Now, as with so many things in computing, there are a bunch of different ways to create semaphores. We have named semaphores and unnamed semaphores. We have POSIX semaphore functions and system five semaphore functions. They all work fine, but some functions only work with other functions. So you get clusters of functions. For this example, we're going to use named semaphores and we're going to use sem open, sem wait, sem post, and sem close. Now, when using named semaphores, we need to give them names, obviously, they're named. Similar to how we gave our shared memory blocks names, one difference here is that the names here don't have to map to an actual file on the disk. Otherwise, it's very, very similar. In this example, I'm going to use two semaphores, one for the producer to signal when it's done producing and one for the consumer to signal when it's done consuming, meaning that someone is free to add another message into the block of shared memory. And we can go into our reader program and set up our two semaphores. The first thing I'm going to do just to be careful is to remove any semaphores that have these same names. Say that we ran the program and it crashed and left an old semaphore around in the system. We don't know what state it's in, so I'm just going to remove it just to be safe. Now we create our semaphores by calling sem open. We give it the name we want it to use. We tell it to create the semaphore if it doesn't exist. We specify its access privileges, which are just like file privileges. And the last argument is the initial value we want our semaphore to start with. So in this case, we'll start it out at zero. Now starting out at zero, remember what this means. That means that calling wait on this semaphore right out of the chute means it's gonna wait. It's already at zero, so it can't decrement it. It's just going to wait until we get our first post call. 
And of course we need to check to see if the function fails. If it did, just print out an error message and exit because this is just a demo program. And then we're going to do the same thing with the consumer semaphore. We're just changing the names. One thing to notice though, of course, is that we did start this semaphore off at a value of one. That means that at the beginning, the first process to call wait on this semaphore will not wait, but it will actually successfully decrement and return. That's going to be important later on when we actually use the semaphores. Now down here in our loop, each time through the loop, we're going to call sem wait on the producer semaphore. This means that it's going to wait until a producer produces something. Then once we're done, then we actually call sem post on the consumer semaphore, and that's going to let exactly one of the producers add data to the block of shared memory. And then just to be tidy, let's close our semaphores when the program is done. And that's it for the reader. Now let's look at the writer. Okay, what we're going to do over here is going to be pretty similar. So let's copy what we have here and bring it with us. Now I'm assuming that the reader will always start first. So these calls to sem open won't create new semaphores, they're just opening them. They're just basically requesting access to them so they can use them. And they will fail if the semaphores don't exist, meaning that the reader isn't running yet. So it's important that the reader be running when the writer starts. Then down in our loop, we're going to do something similar to what we did in the reader, but we're going to flip the use of the semaphores. So here we're going to call sem wait on the consumer semaphore this time. Basically, we're just waiting until we get a signal from the consumer saying, hey, it's your turn to put something into the buffer. And then once we copy our text into the buffer, we signal or call sem post on the producer semaphore, signaling the reader that we've put something in the memory and it's ready for consumption. I also need to remove these lines here because we don't want our producers to be destroying our semaphores because that won't end up well. And now back to the terminal, we compile it. Okay, that looks fine. And we run our reader and it waits just like it's supposed to. The one thing I didn't mention here is that before I add my semaphores, our loop was spinning pretty hard. It was just checking the shared memory over and over and over again. Now with the semaphore, my laptop's fan is a lot quieter. You probably can't hear the difference, but it's a nice change as well. Now this is very similar to what we did with condition variables in my multi-threaded server video series. In case you're interested, you can check that out. And we could have used semaphores over in that video as well. But now if I run my producer, you see that I get all the hello messages. And if I run a bunch of producers, you can see I get all of those messages. And note that if I run this over and over again, they're not always in the same order. And that of course is gonna depend on how the scheduler chose to run those processes. But the point is we're not losing any of the messages, which was our goal. Now there are other ways we could have done this without using shared memory and semaphores. We could have used pipes, named pipes, sockets, message passing. There are also a lot of other things we can do with semaphores. Just be careful, like I mentioned before, getting fancy with semaphores is a great way to end up with software that doesn't work. Please let me know in the comments if this was helpful to you, if you'd like to see more videos like this, if you'd like to see me dive under the hood with things like pipes or some other communication mechanism. Be sure to check out my other videos like these. Subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the next one. And until then, stay safe and happy coding.